This is a homily for the 33rd Sunday in Ordinary Time. The Gospel for this Sunday comes from the Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 13, verses 24 to 32. To download the text of this homily as a PDF file, go to sundayhomilies.au. Once again, let's situate today's Gospel within the overall structure of Mark's Gospel. We're still in the Tuesday of what we now call Holy Week, the final week in the life of Jesus. Well over one-third of Mark's Gospel is dedicated to this final week, beginning with Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem and concluding with the women finding the empty tomb on Easter Sunday morning. Last Sunday's Gospel was taken from the final verses of chapter 12 of Mark's Gospel. Today's Gospel begins at chapter 13, verse 24. This Sunday will be our final week with Mark's Gospel. Next Sunday is the Feast of Christ the King, and in year B, we hear the account from John's Gospel of Jesus being interrogated by Pontius Pilate. Chapter 12 of Mark's Gospel concluded with the story of Jesus watching people making donations to the temple treasury. Many of the rich put in a great deal, but a poor widow came and put in two small coins, all that she had to live on. As we saw last Sunday, this woman, who gave her whole life, foreshadows the fate of Jesus, who was about to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus and the disciples leave the temple. What we now have in chapter 13 of Mark's Gospel is a long instruction that Jesus gives to his disciples at the close of his ministry in Jerusalem. This discourse bears strong similarities to a literary genre that we find elsewhere in the Bible, and that is the Farewell Testament. The Farewell Testament is an address or instruction that a significant teacher or leader gives to his or her disciples just prior to death. By way of example, the entire book of Deuteronomy is a farewell discourse given by Moses just before he dies on the threshold of entering the promised land. The discourse in chapter 13 of Mark's Gospel looks ahead to the life of the church after Jesus' death and resurrection. Jesus tells his disciples about the trials and temptations that his followers will endure, beginning with the destruction of the temple and the city of Jerusalem. There will be wars and turmoil on an international scale. His followers will be persecuted, and there will be betrayal and deceit within the community. The chief purpose of Jesus' instruction is to strengthen and encourage his followers. He has foreseen all of the upheaval that will soon take place, but it will not frustrate the final victory when he will return in glory to extend God's rule over the entire universe once and for all. A major theme in Mark chapter 13 is that everything is taking place according to the divine plan. And so, for faithful disciples, there is nothing to fear. In the opening verses of chapter 13, Jesus predicts the destruction of the temple. One of his disciples says to him, Teacher, look what great stones! Look what great buildings! Keep in mind that in Mark's Gospel, this is the first and only visit of Jesus and his disciples to Jerusalem. And this disciple reacts like a country boy on his first visit to the big city and to the central shrine of Judaism. 
As you can see, the temple was a truly magnificent building. Herod the Great, who died in 4 BC, started extensive renovations of the temple that had been rebuilt in the 6th century following the return from exile in Babylon. The Babylonians had destroyed Solomon's temple in 586 BC, leaving it a pile of rubble. Herod's renovated temple was not only a house of prayer for all nations, but it was also a tourist attraction. The renovation work was not completed until the early 60s AD. The Jewish historian Josephus, who was writing at about the same time that the Gospels were being written, had this to say about the temple. Now the outward face of the temple in its front wanted nothing that was likely to surprise either men's minds or their eyes, for it was covered all over with plates of gold of great weight, and, at the first rising of the sun, reflected back a very fiery splendour, and made those who forced themselves to look upon it to turn their eyes away, just as they would have done at the sun's own rays. The Talmud says, He who has not seen the temple of Herod has never seen a beautiful building in his life. But Jesus then says something that must have startled his disciples. You see these large buildings? Not a single stone will be left on another which will not be pulled down. Jesus here predicts the destruction of the temple which occurred in 70 AD. The words of Jesus echo prophetic traditions about God abandoning the temple and the subsequent destruction of the city that we find in Amos, Jeremiah, Ezekiel and Micah. Here, 2,000 years later, you can still see some of the stones from the destroyed temple. Recent excavations near the Temple Mount in Jerusalem have revealed how the Roman armies in 70 AD used fire to undermine the foundations of the walls, causing huge stones to tumble down into a heap of rubble. In verse 14 there is a reference to the appalling abomination standing where it should not be. This alludes to the appalling abomination mentioned in the prophet Daniel, chapter 9, verse 27. In the context of the prophet Daniel, it referred to the statue of a pagan god, quite possibly Zeus, which was placed in the Jerusalem temple in 168 BC on the orders of the Seleucid king Antiochus Epiphanes. To understand Mark chapter 13 verse 14, we need to determine what event would be comparable to this earlier desecration. Quite possibly, it's a reference to the Roman Emperor Caligula's ambition in 40 AD to have a statue of himself set up and venerated in the temple. This came to an end with Caligula's assassination in 42 AD. In 66 AD, the Jews of Judea revolted against Roman rule. The reasons for the revolt are not entirely clear, but it ended in 70 AD with the destruction of the temple. Josephus provides enough information to piece together a number of diverse causes that seem to have led to the revolt. Chief among them were social unrest, Roman maladministration, revolutionary ardour and a leadership vacuum. According to Josephus, the Roman procurators in the years leading up to the revolt went from bad to worse. Archaeologists have unearthed more than 70 catapult stones used by the Romans during the siege of the city. These stones weigh about 26 kilograms. 
They are catapulted at a speed of about 60 kilometres per hour, and they have a range of 300 metres. They were used to devastating effect on the walls of Jerusalem. In this painting, you can see Roman soldiers plundering the temple, carrying off the menorah, the seven-branched candlestick that was located within the holy place in the temple. This is a scene depicted on the Arch of Titus in Rome. The Roman triumph is celebrated on the Arch of Titus in Rome, very close to the Colosseum. Titus was the Roman general leading the campaign and he eventually became emperor himself in 79 AD. On the inside of the arch, you can see this scene of Roman soldiers carrying booty from the temple, including the menorah. Josephus describes the horror of the temple's destruction. Everywhere was slaughter and flight. Most of the victims were peaceful citizens, weak and unarmed, butchered wherever they were caught. Round the altar, the heaps of corpses grew higher and higher, while down the sanctuary steps poured a river of blood. Jesus and his disciples now leave the temple precinct and cross the Kidron Valley. They're sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple. This is the setting for today's Gospel. This is a photograph of modern-day Jerusalem taken very close to where today's Gospel is set. The Mount of Olives would have offered a good view of the temple complex and of the whole city of Jerusalem. The Jewish temple was located on the site where the Islamic shrine, the Dome of the Rock, now stands. Jesus and his disciples are looking across the Kidron Valley, not at the Dome of the Rock, because it wasn't there then. It wasn't built until almost 700 years later in 691 AD. They're looking across the Kidron Valley to the temple. Here I've superimposed a model of the temple over the site where it once stood. As the disciples look across the valley towards the temple, Peter, James, John and Andrew asked Jesus when the destruction that he'd been speaking about would happen, and what sign will there be that it is about to take place. Jesus then names some of the signs that this is about to take place, wars and rumours of war, nation fighting against nation, earthquakes and famines, you will be handed over to Sanhedrins, you will be beaten in synagogues, brought before governors and kings, and the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. Jesus then talks about the great tribulation that will befall Jerusalem, and this brings us to today's gospel. Chapter 13 now makes a sharp turn into what we call eschatology. Today's Gospel is part of what is often referred to as the eschatological discourse. Eschatology comes from the Greek word eschatos, which means last, and eschata means last things. So eschatology has to do with speculation or teaching about what is going to happen in the future. However, not just any time in the future. It is dealing with the final future, the end of the present world, or at the very least, its radical transformation. This discourse in chapter 13 deals with the fate of Jerusalem and the temple in particular, but also with the end of this present age. In other words, how will the world, as we now know it, come to an end? And what will become of us? To understand today's gospel, we need to understand the worldview behind Mark's gospel. We live in this present age, but we look forward to the age to come. But 
in this present age we are under the influence of various powers opposed to God. We are enslaved to evil powers. We are held captive and need to be set free. As we have already seen, Mark's Gospel gives various names to these powers opposed to God, such as Satan, or devils, or unclean spirits, or Beelzebul, the prince of devils, and legion. We are, therefore, in exile, and we need a new exodus. At some definitive point in the future, God will intervene decisively to overthrow the forces opposed to him. The second coming of Christ, the coming of the Son of Man, will inaugurate the age to come. A new heaven and a new earth, the new creation. We could nuance that a little by saying that the new creation has already been inaugurated through the life, death and resurrection of Jesus, but it has yet to come in all its fullness. So we are living in that time, the time in between. Perhaps we could say that we are living in the already but the not yet Chapter 13 is set in the present time. That will be followed by the beginnings of the birth pangs mentioned in verse 8. This image from pregnancy indicates that when the pain starts, new life will begin. Then we have the birth pangs proper, what we could call the affliction. But what is now suffering will turn to joy. Once the labour pains begin, the birth is inevitable. So history will not come to an end with the destruction of Jerusalem. It is still working its painful way to a final end. Then, at a time we do not know, we have the arrival of the Son of Man, the gathering of the elect and the establishment of the kingdom. This in between time will be marked by human violence and natural disasters, but it will also be a period marked by the proclamation of the gospel to all nations in the face of trial and abuse. Jesus says the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. But when will Jesus come? Do we know the time of his coming? Jesus speaks of the imminent coming of the end time in verse 30. Amen, I say to you, this generation will not pass away before all these things take place. However, he modifies that saying in verse 32. However imminent it may be, the knowledge of when such an event will take place is reserved to the Father. Neither the angels nor even the Son knows when that day or that hour will be. We have a tension here. We know that all things will be brought to their end, but we do not know when that will happen. The disciples are therefore exhorted to stay awake, to keep watch. For Jesus, the salient question is not the when of the end time, but how we live with this expectation. But will there be any signs? This brings us to the fig tree. The fig tree is very common in Palestine, and it is not an evergreen. It announces the coming of summer when the branch of the fig tree becomes tender and puts forth its leaves. From the fig tree learn a parable. As soon as its twigs grow supple and it puts out leaves, you know that summer is near. So with you, when you see these things happening, know that it is near, at the gates. Keep in mind that this so-called eschatological discourse deals with the eschata, the last things, of both Jerusalem and the world. However, it presents them in apocalyptic 
trappings. The English word apocalyptic is an adjective that describes either a genre of literature or a mode of thinking. Apocalyptic comes from the Greek apokalypsis. That word is made up of the prefix apo, which means from, and the verb kalupto, which means to cover, conceal, or veil. So the verb means to remove the cover from, or to uncover. The noun apokalypsis means an unveiling or a revelation. Like all literary genre, apocalyptic has its own stage props, and today's gospel gives us some examples. After talking about the great tribulation of Jerusalem, Jesus then turns to the days after that distress. So we're no longer talking about the fate of Jerusalem, but about the coming of the Son of Man, and what signs will be visible. The sun will be darkened. The moon will lose its brightness. The stars will come falling from heaven. Jesus is alluding here to two passages from the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 13 verse 10 and chapter 34 verse 4. In its original context, the passage from Isaiah chapter 13 verse 10 describes the upcoming defeat of the Babylonians as a cosmic event, we read. In the sky, the stars and Orion will shed their light no longer. The sun will be dark when it rises and the moon will not shed its light. In its original context, the passage from Isaiah chapter 34 verse 4 is a judgment against the nations and against the Edomites in particular. We read, The sky will be rolled up like a scroll, and all their array shall wither, as a leaf falling from the vine, as fruit falling from the fig tree. So apocalyptic writing uses surreal and fantastic imagery, such as upheavals and calamities on a cosmic scale, wars, earthquakes, stars falling from heaven, darkness over the earth, and the moon turning to blood. Apocalyptic discourse sets the conflict between good and evil in black and white. There are no shades of grey. Think of the art form that we know as surrealism. Surrealism is not an attempt to capture reality as a camera would. It's not photorealism. Pablo Picasso once said, Art is a lie that makes us realise the truth. Well, the same could be said of apocalyptic writing. Think of it like this. When we say, It's raining cats and dogs. We don't take that saying literally. We all know what it means. Or, you're driving me up the wall. Or, I'm so hungry I could eat a horse. Every language has its own idioms or literary devices to make a point emphatically. As we've seen, apocalyptic means to remove the veil or to change the metaphor slightly, to open the curtains. Think of it like this. Imagine that you're standing in front of closed curtains. What is hidden by the curtains? The future. That's true, isn't it? We can't be absolutely sure what is going to happen in the future. Apocalyptic writing seeks to draw open the curtain and reveal the future. And why? Because it aims to give comfort, encouragement and hope to people who are living in a time of great distress. It assures them that God is in control of history and that their fidelity will be rewarded. Here's a hypothetical example of how apocalyptic might work. Imagine that you were living in London during the Second World War at the time of the Great Blitz, 
in 1940-1941. Night after night, the Luftwaffe relentlessly bombed the city. The enemy seemed almost invincible. Will the city of London be obliterated? Will the Nazis prevail? In the midst of this destruction and chaos, imagine a prophet proclaiming, I will tell you how all this will end. I will remove the veil and look into the future. I'm looking ahead to 1945. The Nazis have surrendered. Hitler is dead. London rises triumphantly from the ashes. That doesn't mean that in 1940-41 the bombing is stopping. But such a vision would surely give you hope, something to hold on to. In the end, we will be victorious. In the end, all will be well. Chapter 13 is a message of hope, comfort and encouragement for people who are living through great upheavals. New Testament scholar Brendan Burns speculates about the background to chapter 13 of Mark's Gospel. What upheavals were the community for whom Mark wrote his Gospel now enduring? Byrne writes, The warning and prophecies Jesus utters in the discourse on the future in Mark 13 resonate uncannily with accounts of the atrocities perpetrated against Christians in Rome in the year 64 AD, when the Emperor Nero made them the scapegoats for the fire unleashed by him that devastated much of the city. The background to the persecution that Byrne mentions is this. In the summer of 64 AD, a deadly fire broke out in Rome and raged for days. Although fires were common in Rome, the Roman historian Tacitus tells us that this was the most terrible and destructive fire which Rome had ever experienced. The fire began in the region of the Circus Maximus and spread quickly. When it was eventually extinguished, as much as a third of the city was left as a smoking rubble. Tacitus tells us that it was uncertain whether the fire started accidentally or deliberately, but rumours quickly spread that the Emperor Nero was responsible. Other sources, including Suetonius and Dio Cassius, believe that Nero was responsible and record that he sang of the sack of Troy as he watched the city burn. To deflect the blame from himself, Nero had to point the finger at other suspects. Tacitus tells us that Nero blamed the Christian community in Rome. Consequently, to get rid of the report, Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations called Christians by the populace. Besides being put to death, they were made to serve as objects of amusement. They were clad in the hides of beasts and torn to death by dogs. Others were crucified. Others set on fire to serve to illuminate the night when daylight failed. Nero had thrown open his grounds for the display. According to Clement of Alexandria, St Peter and his wife, as well as St Paul, were victims of Nero's persecution, which lasted for several years. The Gospel of Mark is written to assure this persecuted community that Good Friday is not the final word. He who was crucified is risen. And so the message is, stand firm. This is the largest aircraft carrier in the fleet. Night falls. Light bearing on the starboard bow. Is it steady or moving? 
Steady, Captain. Signal that ship. We are on a collision course. Change your course 20 degrees. Suggest you change your course 20 degrees. I am the Admiral of the Fleet. I order you, change your course 20 degrees. I am a seaman second class. You change your course 20 degrees. Change your course 20 degrees. My vessel is the largest aircraft carrier in the fleet. You change your course 20 degrees. I'm a lighthouse. Stand firm and hope in the Lord.